Thanks so much for joining us. Tonight, we're going to be talking all things sperm freezing, um, from how it works to how much it costs to how you can use your sp uh, frozen sperm in the future and pretty much everything in between. This event is uh, sponsored and run by Legacy. Um, so here's a little bit about what we do. Uh, Legacy is a sperm testing and freezing company. We offer at-home semen sample collection for um, analysis, uh, sperm cryopreservation or sperm freezing, which is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, uh, SCI testing, supplements, virtual fertility consults, essentially everything that you need to um, test, improve, preserve your fertility uh, from the comfort of home. And um, we'll be talking a little bit about what that at-home process looks like, um, but that's just an intro of what we do here. Uh, so like I said, I'm Alicia, here I am in the middle. Um, our fertility expert tonight is Stephanie Saborin. Hi, Steph. Say hi. Hey, how are you? <laughs> um, Steph is a nurse and the head of clinical services here at Legacy. Um, her professional background is in neurology surgery, specifically men's health, and she has been working in this space for the past 10 years. Um, she's certified in andrology, which is the science of sperm, um, and she is a member of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Here at Legacy, she serves as a clinical educator, and she sees Legacy patients as well, uh, working with individuals and couples who are looking to better understand improve and preserve their fertility. Uh, Steph will be talking through a lot of the medical and scientific information here tonight, as well as answering questions at the end. Um, we're also joined by Jacqueline. Say hi, Jacqueline. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, we call her JD also. If you hear me say that throughout, that's just a little nickname. Uh, Jacqueline is a client experience team lead and a senior specialist here at Legacy. She is also AFRM certified in andrology um, and has a background in client patient care in addition to her own unique fertility journey. Um, she's had thousands of conversations with people like you, everyone here on the call joining us. Um, looking for guidance, and she's an advocate on their path to parenthood over her last three years at Legacy. Um, Jacqueline or JD and the rest of the client experience team is really here to um, help our clients like fully understand the process, set them up for success. Um, she will guide us through logistical and financial considerations for sperm freezing tonight and answer some questions uh, in that realm as well. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to cover tonight. We are going to be discussing everything that you need to know about uh, sperm freezing. So um, everything from uh, the benefits of freezing your sperm, like why would you actually do this process, um, to what the process looks like, how it actually works, um, success rates of using frozen sperm later in your life, how to prepare to freeze the healthiest sample, um, choosing the right sperm freezing plan for you, for your individual needs, and for um, your budget, and then payment options. Because we know this is, it, it's an investment, right? It's an investment in your future fertility. So we want to go through the options that you have to pay for that. So first we're gonna start off with benefits to freezing your sperm. Um, basically like, why would you do this? Why would you go through this process? Um, to really understand that we need to dive into basically some of like the major factors that can affect your future fertility and your family building options. So Steph is gonna kick us off with understanding those factors. Steph. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, so uh, there are many reasons uh, people may decide to do these types of things like freeze their sperm. But one of the reasons that you might uh, consider sperm freezing is because there is nothing you can do to stop the aging process. So uh, one thing I can guarantee for all of us here is that every year we are gonna be one year older than the last. Uh, so why does that matter? Wh why does that impact your sperm freezing or your sperm health? Well, uh, sperm quality declines with age. So that makes successful conception significantly more difficult. Every year you're gonna lose almost a whole percentage point in motility. So that is how the sperm are swimming and moving. Your sperm morphology decreases by 0.65%. Morphology is referring specifically to the size and shape of sperm. And you're also gonna see one and a half more genetic mutations carried by sperm every year. So what does that mean? So let's say in seven years, seven years time, your motility is gonna be 5.6% lower than it is today. Your morphology will worsen by 4.55% and you will have 10 and a half additional genetic mutations present from what you have today. So DNA fragmentation, uh, which is damage to the genetic material that is carried by sperm also increases with age, making conception after age 40 much more difficult. Now, what we're gonna show you here is some data from a study that was done on a group of 475 men that were presenting, all presenting with infertility. Now, DNA fragmentation results of this population are all elevated, but higher elevations were seen related specifically to higher age brackets. 
Now, higher levels of DNA fragmentation can lead to poor embryo quality for those who are embarking on something like IVF. I can lead to the inability to achieve conception at all, or even an increased risk of miscarriage or recurrent miscarriage or pregnancy loss. Now, men, we're still talking age here, so men over the age of 40 are 30% more likely to experience infertility compared to men in their 20s. So research is showing us that people are starting their families much later in life than they did in years past. So this is becoming more and more important. Also, a much more alarming fact is that sperm from people over the age of 40 has a six times higher likelihood of producing a child with a congenital condition. So this can include things like autism spectrum disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, or even some childhood cancers. Now, when you are freezing your sperm, you really are essentially freezing time. Frozen samples do not degrade at all, regardless of the length of time that they're frozen. So that means if you were to freeze your sperm, say at age 25, for example, and you uh, ever use that sample to conceive, so let's say even if you're 45 years old at the time you use it, it would still be as if 25 year old you conceived that child. So you're talking about that much better motility, significant less genetic mutations and all of those things that we just talked about. Also, global fertility rates have declined incredibly by half actually over the last 70 years. So this means that we're right out of the gate only half as fertile as our grandfathers once were. So we're already behind the eight ball here. Sperm counts are declining 2.6% year over year. Average sperm counts back in 1973 were about 99 million per milliliter. We measure everything in volume here. Um, in 2011, only 38 years later, average sperm count had dropped more than half down to 47.1 million sperm per milliliter. Now that was back in 2011. It is 2024. So those numbers are likely much lower even than that now today. They actually did a, a follow-up study, I think in uh, 2016, that found it was it was dropping even more dramatically now after, yeah. after 2011, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and the reason being for that is largely due to endocrine disrupting chemical exposure and lifestyle factors as well. But the endocrine disrupting chemicals and lifestyle are really the two major factors believed to be contributing to these worldwide declines in sperm count and quality. Um, before we go on stuff, can you, because this might be something that a couple of people on the call have maybe never heard of before, but can you go through like, what is an endocrine disrupting chemical and where we find them? Like, how are we exposed to these? Absolutely. That's actually a really good question, Alicia. Thank you. Um, so these are going to be things that you might have heard about this in the news or in things that you've read. Uh, these are exposures to things like chemicals and plastics, among other things. Um, what they are, endocrine disrupting chemicals are things that are going to impact our hormone system specifically and subsequently are impacting our fertility. Mm -hmm. So these are found in everyday products in your home. It could be things like pesticides you may be using in your lawn or garden, uh, plastics that our food or our water comes in, uh, fragrance containing products. That's not just perfumes, but that could be scented candles, air fresheners, lotions or body or skincare products, soap even, um, even our shampoos. Um, also, any sort of lead or heavy metal exposures or even flame retardants. And every time I bring that up, people say flame retardants. I don't work with those. Um, but what people don't even realize is it's in fabrics, clothing that we wear, even high amounts of it in children's pajamas. Um, the average person is exposed to 10 or more different endocrine disrupting chemicals every month. This number can be even higher based on what you do for a living. So we have people who are in what I would consider to be more high risk jobs or occupations. Um, that could be things like people who are serving in the military or maybe airline workers with those jet fuel exposures they have. Um, anyone working in farming or agriculture or firefighters, that's just a few, there are many, um, that would have significantly more exposures just due to occupational hazards. Sure. Steph, I was just thinking about a recent article that I read. Um, it was on a university study uh, about microplastics, and it was talking about uh, how people consume up to a credit card's worth of plastic every week. And even more startling was that most of it comes from our drinking water and from shellfish. 
I know that kind of, I actually read the same one. It kind of breaks my heart a little every time I share information like that with people. I obviously live in the Boston area. Uh, we consume a very lot of shellfish and I cringe, <laughs> every, you know, makes you think twice about things you don't think about, like your water you're drinking or the foods that you're eating. So important. Um, so we talked about age and endocrine disrupting chemicals. They affect pretty much all of us. But also I want to highlight people who are going through any sort of you know, medical treatments or have upcoming medical treatments, there's going to be a little bit of additional urgency around the need for sperm freezing for people in those populations. So that could be individuals who, uh, who really should be freezing their sperm. These are people who might be thinking about starting on testosterone replacement therapy. Uh, anyone who is thinking about embarking on gender affirming hormone therapy or anyone undergoing cancer treatment, this is not just for testicular or prostate cancers, this is any cancer, it's the chemotherapy radiation that we worry about having long standing impact on fertility. Um, anyone who's undergoing any sort of pelvic surgery, hernia surgery, or anyone who's considering a vasectomy who may be planning to do that in the future as well. Um, also, anyone who's taking prescription medications that may be known to cause issues with sperm parameters. So that could be anything from some of the common ones like uh, Propecia or Finasteride is the other name for that one that's actually used for hair loss prevention. Um, there's also a particular drug class of antidepressants called SSRIs. Not all antidepressants are within this particular drug class. Um, but those are known to impact fertility, um, as well as many others. So also, I will mention again, you know, anyone who is planning on a vasectomy, really, it is always a good idea to freeze your sperm in advance, just in case <laughs> having a backup plan, if I had a dollar every time I heard after 10 years now working in urology surgery, somebody had a change in life, change in family situation, um, you know, second marriages, all of a sudden people want additional kids they never thought or planned on having. Um, it's much more difficult if you don't have something stored. So uh, there are others as well um, as those that I just mentioned who really should be freezing their sperm. Uh, those are people who have occupational risks or increased occupational risks or hazard. So any roles that involve any sort of increased risk of physical injury, um, exposure to toxic chemicals or radiation, or even negative lifestyle factors such as exposures to heat or even sleep deprivation that comes from certain uh, areas of employment. Um, a few examples of these types of jobs are going to be anyone serving, again, in the U.S. military, police, fire, agricultural workers, manufacturing, healthcare workers. Um, talk about sleep deprivation. I don't know a resident that has slept a full, you know, a full night's sleep in years. Um, it, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, um, and it's really only including just a few common examples. There are so many more, um, but these are all things that you really want to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about whether or not sperm freezing may or may not be right for you. And I want to talk about lifestyle factors that can also impact your sperm health. Now, this is a really important topic because most people don't realize how big of an impact lifestyle can have on our fertility at all. Uh, some of the largest impacts from lifestyle can come from our diet, uh, smoking cigarettes or cannabis containing products that's either smoked or edibles, uh, recreational drug use or alcohol consumption, sleep or really more the lack thereof, um, and our exercise habits, really also anything that could cause increases to scrotal temperature. So that could be things like steam rooms, saunas, hot tubs, hot yoga this time of year. If you're in the New England area like me, those heated seats in your car, it's 19 degrees out today here. Um, so certainly my heated seats were on, um, all things that need to be considered. Great. Thanks, Steph. Um, okay, so say someone knows that, that, that they're interested in sperm freezing, they really want to explore this process. Um, how does that process work? What does that process look like? Uh, JD, can you walk us through that process? Absolutely. So sperm freezing is usually divided into three steps. And with legacy, you get to do that first step from home. Freezing sperm from home is really simple and very easy. First, you collect a sample via masturbation from the comfort and privacy of your own home. The sample is picked up by FedEx directly from your doorstep, doorstep at no charge and shipped overnight to our lab where it's tested and subsequently frozen. That's it. This can all be done without seeing a doctor, no six month wait list, no awkward clinic experience with the dreaded black leather couch or old used pornographic materials. It's, it's really that easy. 
Um, so how does that actually work? So we're mailing the sample in. I know if there's anyone on this call who's ever done um, uh, sperm freezing or IVF or anything like that before, they might be familiar with the fact that clinics will usually ask for the sample to be there within like 45 to 60 minutes. So um, Steph, how does it work that we're able to analyze and, and freeze a sample after it's been shipped? Yeah, that's a really important thing to talk about because coming from a hospital-based background, we had patients coming in and doing this on site, which you know, yeah, nobody wants to do that. It's very <laughs> unpleasant doing it in the clinical setting. Um, for those who are bringing it into a clinic um, because they want the privacy of comfort of home to produce their sample, you, the clock is ticking from the moment that sample is produced. You've really got 45 minutes or less technically. Uh, less is ideal. You're really maxing out when you get up into those 45 plus minute timeframes. So you've got 45 minutes where you need to produce your sample at home, quickly get yourself dressed, ready together. Your sample is technically supposed to be kept at body temperature, which means you're trying to somehow hold a sample cup under your armpit between your legs while you're driving and in some way keeping it at body temperature while you immediately have to rush to the clinic or doctor's office. And hopefully you live within 45 minutes of being able to do this because that's when that sample needs to actually be tested. So when I say the clock is ticking, that motility is dropping off. Um, and that's really gonna become problematic for people if they're not making it in a timely manner. Really, you're not gonna get the most accurate results. Now, the reason we are able to offer these types of services for testing and freezing sperm from home is because of the transport buffer media that's included with the test kit. So this transport media that we're using is clinically proven and sound. Um, and what it does is it protects and extends the life of sperm for overnight shipping. So how this works or why this works is that this buffer contains some antibiotics, which are going to prevent any sort of bacterial growth in the sample. It's also got some carbohydrates, which fuel, so to speak, or feed the sperm. This is what they live off of. And a buffer media, which keeps the pH level stable. So because of this, uh, you no longer need to worry about that clock ticking 45 minute time window to get this sample back to the clinic. And I wanna walk you through the process um, of what this looks like in the lab. So first off, the sample is gonna be analyzed. Um, so that's doing a standard semen analysis. So that'll be performed. And then if you were to have um, elected to do some DNA fragmentation testing, that would be done at that time as well. Uh, it's then washed using a sperm wash solution and separated into four separate vials. So each sample cup that you produce would be divided into four vials. Now, once that is done, a cryoprotectant solution is added to the vials, which protects the sample through the freezing process. And I'll explain in a minute how that works. Um, and then those vials are then placed into cryogenic tanks. So these are very large tanks where they're exposed to liquid nitrogen or uh, liquid nitrogen vapor. So this is gonna be at temperatures of negative 196 degrees Celsius. So that is pretty cold. That equates to about negative 320.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now, once this process is complete, with Legacy, a very small portion of each sample is thawed and a post-thaw motility analysis is then performed. Now, this is something that tells us how the sperm sustained and survived through that freezing and thawing process. We know that all sperm have different levels of resiliency to that process. Um, and now this is something that most labs do not do on the front end, but really can be extremely valuable information to have up front, especially to help you to plan or determine what your options may be for using the sample in the future. And we're going to share a really quick video um, for any of you who are visual learners. Uh, you know, this is just going to show you sort of some of the process. I'll kind of talk over it a little bit as it plays. Um, but what that process can look like, obviously, this is fast forwarded, and this is some sperm swimming, so the semen sample being processed and analyzed, we are looking at the specimens under the microscope. Uh, these are things you cannot see, the naked eye. During the post thaw motility check, this is that small portion that I talked about. The cryoprotectant solution here is being added. And what the cryoprotectant does is it actually draws all of the water out of the sperm cell to prevent damage during that freezing process. That's how that cryoprotectant works. 
And then at this point, you see some vials being plunged into a cryo tank. These come in varying sizes, even much larger than this, some of them in our labs. Um, and that is where they are plunged into that liquid nitrogen, which brings it down to negative 196 degrees Celsius. At that point, frozen sperm really can be stored indefinitely. Um, that's it, that's the process. So for something that is uh, so complex of a process that can be done uh, quite easily and having the ability to do this from home now um, has really been a game changer for many. Now, jumping onto this next slide, like I had just said previously, at negative 196 degrees Celsius, all biological activity in the cell is paused or literally frozen. So this is what's happening when I say that you can really, you're essentially freezing time when you freeze sperm. It is because all of that uh, biologic activity is just stopped uh, in the moment. Great, um, awesome. So once the samples are frozen, um, they're at this extremely cold temperature, um, where do they go? How are they protected? Um, can you walk us through that process, Jacqueline? Absolutely. Samples are stored long term in state of the art cryogenic facilities, and these facilities are monitored 24 seven with live video and digital alarms. They're also screened by the FDA and CDC for safety and security, and they're equipped with backup power sources in case of natural disaster. As an added level of safety and security, Legacy uses multi-site storage for all samples, so your samples will be split equally amongst two locations. That way, if a sinkhole opens up and it swallows one facility, you still have vials available at another facility. Yeah, and the likelihood of that hopefully quite low, but it's good to know there's a backup just in case. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about success rates when you're using frozen sperm. I know, you know, if anybody is doing this process, it's because they they want the option to use this sperm in the future. So what is that? Uh, what do those success rates look like? Um, Steph, can you walk us through? Absolutely. And I also don't know of any sinkholes that have eaten any <laughs> facilities as of yet. So you can feel good about that. Um, so you're going to have a few options in how you can use your frozen sample in the future. So the first option I talk about is something called IUI. So during IUI or intrauterine inception, um, the, during that procedure, sperm is literally placed directly into the uterus using a small catheter. Uh, the goal of this treatment is to improve chances of fertilization by increasing the number of healthy sperm that are able to reach the fallopian tubes, that's where that egg is, uh, when a woman is most fertile. Now, IUI is a widely used treatment option because really it's, it's minimally invasive. Um, it's a lo much lower cost alternative to in vitro fertilization or IVF, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it can be conveniently performed in your doctor's OBGYN office by a nurse midwife, nurse practitioner, or your OBGYN. And you do not require a reproductive endocrinologist to perform this procedure. Now, the other option, which is sort of twofold, it's either IVF or IVF with ICSI, which is just an abbreviation, ICSI. Uh, traditional in vitro fertilization is just a type of assistive reproductive uh, technology where sperm and an egg are fertilized outside of the human body. So this is a complex process that involves retrieving eggs from ovaries uh, surgically and then manually combining them with sperm in the lab in a Petri dish. Uh, several days after fertilization, those fertilized eggs, which would now become embryos, would be placed into a uterus and then pregnancy occurs when an embryo is able to implant itself onto the uterine wall. Now, this procedure must be facilitated by a reproductive endocrinologist in a fertility clinic setting. This isn't something that can just be done um, you know, quickly in the office and then off to work you go. Um, it's definitely uh, a lot more invasive. Um, the ICSI process of IVF is just an additional IVF uh, technique, which uh, a single sperm would be injected directly into the egg. So not swimming around that egg, but you would actually take a needle that cannot be seen by the naked eye under a microscope uh, to draw up one singular sperm and then inject that singular sperm directly into the egg to fertilize it. So if someone is using frozen sperm, can they do IUI or IVF? Like both of these are options for them? Yes, with a slight caveat. So there are some minimum concentration and motility requirements for IUI. 
Um, so having that post-thaw motility analysis that I talked about earlier um, is extremely valuable for those helping to determine which procedure may be right for them. Um, ICSI or IVF with ICSI is an option for anyone, even for people with literally almost no motility or very limited quantities of sperm or even a combination of the two, very low counts as well as low to no motility, um, they are still candidates for IVF with ICSI. So there's different options for everyone. Uh, it's terribly traumatic when you are going in for what you thought was um, an IUI procedure your sample gets thawed, and if you didn't do it with legacy and have a post on motility analysis, um, here you are ready to go, and you find out you have no motility, then IUI is off the table. You've already thawed your sample. You're not prepared for IVF. This is an entire vial or sample lost for someone. That can be absolutely devastating, especially for those who may only have a few vials to work with at all to begin with. So, um, I'll talk you through here, as you can see, um, research shows success rates using fresh versus, versus frozen sperm are really quite similar comparatively. Um, there's not much of a difference. I'll use the IVF category that you can see there in the middle of the slide, um, just to, as an example. So frozen sperm used for IVF yielded about a 15 to 53% success rate while fresh sperm used in IVF yielded 15 to 62% success rates. Now, where do we get these numbers? So the lower parameters, the 15% on both, these are from research studies that were done uh, using older eggs. These are non-donors. These are individuals over the age of 30. Uh, the upper parameters for success, so that's the 50, you know, 53 to 62 there that you see in the middle, um, those upper levels were from research uh, done using donor eggs, where the donor was between the ages of 20 and 30 years of age. Now, that doesn't necessarily, or this doesn't necessarily define your exact success rates that you can expect, because there's a lot of variables that need to be considered um, here as well. But really, it's just simply a comparative viewing of the differences of using fresh versus frozen sperm. So would you say like the bottom line here basically is that um, the research supports the idea that there's not much of a clinical difference between fresh and frozen. Both are good options. Exactly. Um, and Jacqueline, can you talk us through what you would normally recommend to clients that you're speaking with as far as amounts of sperm to store? Where do they go from here? Definitely. There's usually three things that I tell people to consider uh, when they're considering how many samples they'd like to freeze. Number one being your desired number of children. The number of vials that you choose is going to correlate directly to the number of attempts that you'll have at either IUI or IVF. Even if you're unsure, you can still prepare for any eventuality with Legacy. I talk to people every day that are in their early 20s or they've just launched their career or they don't even know if they wanna have children. Um, and um, that's okay. We have plans that range from one sample with four vials and one year of cryogenic storage all the way through to our lifetime plan, which allows for three samples or 12 vials and 25 years of storage. So in any case, we have you covered. Um, and then number two being the intended use of the sample. Um, this will vary for some people. You may want to use your sample for IUI, which while more affordable may take more attempts before you achieve a pregnancy. Um, you may want to skip right to IVF, which is more expensive, but carries a higher success rate, like you explained, Steph. Um, and then number three, your individual semen parameters and any permanent life changes you may be going through. Uh, these will also assist you in deciding on how to use your sample. So for example, IUI may not be the best option for those with subpar results due to lifestyle or medical reasons. And having the data that comes with legacy semen analysis at your fingertips is crucial for making the best decision. That's only part of it though. If you're undergoing anything like gender affirmation or oncology treatment, testosterone replacement, you may wanna consider banking more vials to increase your chances of creating the family you desire in the future, especially if going through that permanent life change means that you may not have the option to bank healthy viable sperm later. And what many people don't know is that sperm can be frozen indefinitely. And Steph, can you speak more to that? 
Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. Absolutely. And that is absolutely correct. Sperm, like I had said before, it can stay frozen indefinitely. Um, you're going to hear this more than once from me today, <laughs> um, but frozen sperm never degrade with time. That is so important. So there's also no difference in successful pregnancy rates, whether the sperm was frozen for one, five, or even 15 years. Um, thank you so much, uh, Seth and JD, for that explanation. So um, it seems like the the quality of the sperm going into the freezing process is pretty important to the level of success that you can expect from that sperm. Um, we know for some people who are doing this, like before medical treatment, they don't have time to try to get their best sperm ever. They're just freezing because it's important for them right now. But for someone that might have a little more time, um, like they're planning to do this procedure in the next couple months, um, what are some things they can do now to make sure that they're freezing their best, healthiest sample? Thank you. And yeah, I, I do want to reiterate that obviously those who have more pressing needs or medical issues happening um, or more urgent time windows, obviously better to have something than nothing. So you don't have to worry about working on improving parameters or anything like that. If you need to produce a sample and now it's your only chance, move forward and do it now. Um, but if you have a little time, um, I'll explain, you know, sort of how the process works. So spermatogenesis, so that's uh, the sperm development life cycle. Um, that process takes about 74 days. So if you are thinking about freezing your sperm and not do, uh, you know, you have a few months, um, you know, this would be a good idea to start thinking about ways to optimize or improve your sperm health prior to freezing. So ideally, this is going to occur 74 to 90 days before you produce your sample, if at all possible. And I can walk you through a few considerations when doing this. So I'll start us off with diet. So this chart gives a really great picture, simple, of what your diet should look like to optimize fertility potential. Now you can pull your cell phones out, take a screenshot, take a picture, but really at the end of the day, there really is no specific diet or magic food that you can eat that's going to improve your fertility. It really all boils down to just simply maintaining a normal, healthy, well-balanced diet uh, and then this chart is just one way that can help you understand what that should look like in the simplest of terms. Um, next thing we'll talk about is exercise. So actually moderate exercise is what would be most recommended. So this can be many things. This could be jogging. This could be light weight training or walking or even yoga classes, not to be confused with that hot yoga that I will tell everyone to stay away from. Uh, but if you haven't left your couch or seen the inside of a gym in five or 10 years, that's okay, no judgment here. Um, but please don't go crazy joining a CrossFit gym or starting boot camp workouts. Really, it's more important that you start slow and actually just keep it moderate. You're more likely to hurt yourself uh, by stepping foot in the gym and starting a CrossFit workout after a 10 year couch hiatus. Um, and then you're not going to be doing much of anything. So it will do you no good. And research actually shows us that the largest improvements in sperm health directly related to exercise come from just those moderate intensity workouts. So that means that walking or jogging, for example, so 30 to 60 minutes, three to six times a week, that moderate uh, exercise yielded better results than the much more vigorous or high intensity workouts did anyway. So really, what is this? tell us just go take a walk. It's that simple. Uh, this next one is a, is a touchy subject in my household, and that is sleep. Uh, most of us, I would say, admittedly, myself included, uh, don't get enough sleep. Now, this is an extremely important part of the body's recovery process, and good quality sleep is needed for good sperm health. They go hand in hand. So you really should be aiming for seven to eight hours a night of uninterrupted sleep. <laughs> so that means turn off your TV, uh, stay off your cell phone in bed. Uh, for many people, an extra hour of sleep actually outweighs an extra hour in the gym. So it's really important to try and prioritize just getting some not just good sleep, but good quality sleep as well. And that rolls us into supplements. Um, I talk about this all day, every day. <laughs> supplements, they really have been heavily researched over the years. There is clinical evidence that certain supplements do in fact improve sperm quality. 
So usually I recommend going down two different courses uh, or options really based on what you're doing now. First would be the easiest um, because it's a one and done. And that would be finding yourself uh, some sort of a comprehensive male fertility supplement blend. Now, not all supplement blends are created equal. You need to read labels. It's very important. A lot of them are very similar. And once you start doing side-by-side -side comparisons of the labels, you'll see a lot of similarities, similar to almost exact ingredient lists. But what you need to pay attention to is the dosing. All of the clinical research is surrounding specific dosing. And in particular, um, you wanna make sure that you're finding something that contains three to 400 milligrams of CoQ10. You can screenshot or take pictures of this slide as well if you need to, or write them on down. Um, but the dosing is super important. Um, so you're gonna want something that has three to 400 milligrams of that CoQ10 in addition to other ingredients like vitamins D, C, uh, D aspartic acid, folate, uh, zinc, magnesium, amongst other things. That's just a few. Um, if you didn't want to take a comprehensive blend, you can kind of create your own in a simple way. So let's say you're already taking an over-the-counter, you know, one a day generic vitamin. That's great. Um, I would have you add in to your one a day multi three to 400 milligrams per day of CoQ10, along with 2000 milligrams of vitamin C. Now vitamin C you can obtain through your foods as well. Um, you can do a quick internet search on foods rich in vitamin C and get a list and try to increase those in your diet. Um, I tell you 2000 milligrams because when you're taking vitamins as supplements, they are absorbed differently than they are through our foods. So most of that is just gonna be excreted from your body. Um, so 2000 is the recommended dose on the vitamin C. And then lastly, I have become a, a really big fan of ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is an Indian ginseng supplement. Uh, this is something that's pretty readily available, all of these things readily available at any retail pharmacy. Um, ashwagandha in doses of 675 milligrams or greater per day um, have shown to help improve sperm quality. They also have some really great added side effects as well, like improved sleep, libido, or even mood. Um, so this is a really popular one that the more research I read about it, the more I like it. Uh, what I warn people about with ashwagandha, you don't see it in many supplement blends. Reason being is that it does have a slightly unpleasant smell and taste to it. Um, so if you're someone that is really sensitive to that, that's something I would caution you on um, when you open that bottle. Um, you know, if that is something that bothers you, it may not be the right supplement for you, but if it doesn't and you can get past that, it isn't so bad that it knocks you over, but it is noticeable enough that people bring it up often. Um, it is something to be aware of. Now, I talked about all these positive things, these good things, these things we like. We like good sleep, good diet, good exercise, supplements. Now we're gonna talk about what you should not be doing or what we should be avoiding altogether. So for starters, uh, cigarettes, um, e-cigarettes, vaping. Um, there's lots of bad things that come from smoking cigarettes. Um, having problems with sperm is just one of many. So it's not a good idea. If you are someone who's smoking, now would be a great time to start thinking about ways to quit um, or taking a little break from that. Uh, also cannabis products. Now, again, this is smoked or edible. With the legalization of marijuana in so many states, we're seeing more research surrounding it. And the one thing that the research has all consistently and pretty definitively shown us is that marijuana consumption has a hugely negative impact on sperm quality. So if you are someone who is consuming marijuana products, I'd recommend you take a breather for the next few months if you're planning on freezing your sperm uh, to try to make sure that you're putting forth the healthiest sperm possible to be saved. Um, also, out, we'll talk about alcohol consumption. Now, what I refer to as excessive alcohol use um, may not be what the average person considers excessive. This is excessive from a clinical perspective, which means anything more than seven drinks per week. So you can still consume alcohol when you're looking to either conceive or improve your sperm health, but you really need to keep it below seven. Now, you shouldn't be aiming for seven as the goal, right? We want to, <laughs> less is more here, moderation is everything, um, but you really want to keep it to less than seven. At seven is where the research shows the drop-offs in sperm quality. Once you hit 10, it's a much deeper dive. Um, and then at, there were some research studies done around 24 drinks per week, but that's like a whole lifestyle thing you need to look at, <laughs> as well as the negative uh, impacts to your fertility. So uh, those are things that I would caution people around, as well as 
things like uh, saunas or hot tubs, anything I refer to as saddle sports. So that could be your Peloton or bicycle riding, horseback riding, anything that has you seated in a straddled position. Really also anything that's gonna cause some overheating to the scrotum in general. So this even could be working with your laptop computer actually on your lap um, or those heated seats in your car because it's cold and it's winter. Um, same thing with medications that can impact sperm health. So there are some pretty obvious ones like um, testosterone or anabolic steroids. Anything you get from a guy at the gym out of a duffel bag is usually bad news for your fertility. Um, could be estrogens and some antidepressants or hair loss prevention medications and so many others, meds that are used for migraines, kidney stones, gout. This is a very short list here. Um, if you have any questions, if you're on prescribed medications, um, and you're not sure if they will or won't impact your fertility. Um, for one, I tell everybody, please do not just stop taking your prescribed medications. <laughs> do not do that. Talk to your prescriber first um, and your pharmacist. Your pharmacist is the absolute best resource when it comes, honestly, better than your prescriber in most cases. Pharmacists, this is all they do. They know every little in and out and side effect of a med, some things that maybe your prescribers may not realize or know or be um, as well informed on. So your pharmacist is, you know, walk up to that drugstore counter, don't go to the drive through talk to them. Uh, it's free, they're available. Anytime they're open, that's your best resource. And then the last one I'll touch upon, and I just cringe every time I have to tell anybody about this, are those ice baths, those cold plunges. They've become so popular. Everyone's out there buying out all of the giant chest freezers in the stores. They're filling them with ice cubes and water, and they're doing these cold soak plunges. That's my worst nightmare, um, is getting into <laughs> one of those cold pools. I can't believe people do it on purpose um, and even pay to do it, but it's become so popular. But it is showing to have a hugely negative impact on fertility as well. You're shocking the system with those high temps, you're equally shocking the system and your body's ability to best produce and maintain sperm at those low, super low cold temps as well. Well, great, thank you so much, Steph. I do want to uh, send it over to JD um, to talk through basically how to choose a legacy plan and how to pay for it. Awesome. As I mentioned earlier, sperm freezing plans have a few variables, such as how many samples you'd like frozen, how long you'd like to store for before having to renew your plan or before deciding to withdraw your vials for use, and the type of testing that's performed on the sample as well. In fact, one of the most common questions we encounter on a daily basis is, how do I know if my sample's viable for freezing? Do you analyze my sample before it's frozen and what kind of testing is performed? The answer to this is that all samples come into our care and are put through the standard semen analysis, which tests the five parameters of sperm health. The report you receive is going to tell you exactly what your count, concentration, motility, morphology, and volume are. Some of our more comprehensive plans also include our DNA fragmentation analysis for additional insight into the cellular health of your sperm that Steph talked about earlier. Um, and then Steph, before we dive into plans and pricing, can you tell us a little bit more about the value of banking more vials early on when it comes to IUI versus IVF and choosing a plan? Absolutely. Um, I often speak with patients about the benefits of having more samples preserved. It makes a whole lot of spend, uh, sense to you know, spend just a really small amount extra on more vials on the front end. Um, you know, which really for will meet the difference for many people between whether or not IUI or IVF is the method of conception that they'll be able to use. And like I had stated earlier, success rates for IUI, they are lower than IVF. But important and really worth noting is the cost savings of IUI versus IVF. So if it is on the table for you, if your parameters are such that you could kind of go either direction, you know, the costs are they vary based a lot clinic to clinic, state to state, but on average, IUI is about $1,500 per cycle versus IVF, which rings the register at about $20,000 per cycle. So that is no small amount of difference, um, which is really one of the many reasons why it does and can make a lot more sense to store more sperm up front um, to have that option still be available for you. Also worth mentioning is that IUI is also non-invasive. It is really no more invasive than a standard pap smear test that women are undergoing annually with their OBGYNs now anyway. Um, whereas IVF is a bit more invasive. It involves uh, painful surgical procedures, multiple procedures in order to facilitate. So those are things to keep in mind as well. 
Wow. I'm still thinking about that price difference. That's about $18,000 on average. And I could think of a lot of things I could spend $18,000 on. <laughs> Same. <laughs> So let's explore some of the many storage plans that Legacy offers. These are just a few examples of the options available depending on your preferences. The first one is our standard semen analysis plus one year of storage. This is a great starter plan for those that have children and want a just in case plan, or for those who are looking for the most affordable option. You get a clinical semen analysis and one year of secure storage for $440, which is less than $2 a day. The second one is our For Tomorrow plan, and this is hands down one of the most popular plans that people ask us about because it strikes the perfect balance between value and length of storage. For $1,195, you get two semen analysis kits, which will yield eight vials and five years of secure storage and a complimentary STI analysis kit. We also offer what I like to call our ultimate peace of mind plan, which is the one on the end there. It's our forever plan. This is especially great for people who don't want to have to worry about renewals or having enough sperm to bank for future use after a permanent life change. Um, this plan comes with three semen analysis kits, which will yield 12 vials and also a 25 year secure cryo storage plan. It also comes with a complimentary STI kit. And my favorite part is there is also one complimentary vial withdrawal to the clinic of your choice included in this plan. Uh, this plan is an exceptional value at $3,995, which breaks down to only $160 per year. And I do just want to make a quick note on STI testing, because we did mention that that is included in some of these packages. Obviously, there's many more bundle options and package options even than what we're sharing today. Um, but anyone who is freezing their sperm should always have STI testing done close to the time that their sample is being produced. Now, many fertility clinics actually do require that this is done. So if you do not have STI test results, it could cause an issue with your ability to actually utilize your frozen sample in the future. Uh, STI testing can be done with Legacy at home, or but you don't have to do it with Legacy. You can do this with your primary care doctor. You can go to any community clinic um, and have this done, but it's just really important that it doesn't matter where you do it as much as the fact that you do do it. Um, at Legacy, with our STI testing, we're able to test for chlamydia, gonorrhea, hepatitis A and B, HIV 1 and 2, and syphilis. Uh, through Legacy, this is all done via a finger stick for a blood sample, as well as a urine sample. And I do also want to mention, this is really important as well, um, that testing positive for one or even all of these things does not mean that you can't use your sample you can test positive for one or all of these things and still use this sample and freeze it for future use. So really important to know. And just as a quick side note, I know people get excited when they hear that they have to stick themselves at home with the Lancet, the little finger prick. It's nothing to get excited about. Um, it's much less of a pain than visiting a lab. You're not getting a needle stick. It's just a tiny little poke. It doesn't hurt at all. I've actually tested our kit and it's not bad. If you need someone to talk you through it, give us a call. But I don't want anybody out there that has a fear of needles or, or sticking themselves to get excited about that. Yeah, no, thank Excited. you. I'm glad you that out. <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, let us move on to our last um, topic tonight, which is how to pay for this. Um, so like we mentioned before, this is an investment, right? Um, and it can be expensive, especially when you're looking at that 25-year plan. Um, but let's go through some of those options um, to make that a little bit easier for folks. So JG, can you walk us through that? Absolutely. This is one of my favorite things to talk about because I think this should be something that's accessible for everybody. So um, I love discussing all the options we have because we can definitely come up with something that works for most folks. Um, the first one being uh, we do offer insurance coverage and we do have an insurance eligibility tool on our website where you can plug in your membership ID number to see if you're eligible to receive a legacy semen analysis kit and when you're freezing through your carrier, often with no out-of-pocket costs to you, depending on your plan. Um, there's, and the only thing better than low cost is free, right? So um, definitely check that out. Um, and again, it does depend on your insurance plan. So some may be subject to co-payments or deductibles, but you can check with your insurance carrier or our legacy billing insurance specialists um, if you have any questions surrounding eligibility or coverage. 
The next option would be fertility benefits providers. These providers fill in the gap of insurance coverage because many insurances don't cover proactive sperm freezing or other fertility preservation without medical necessity. And when it comes to fertility benefits, plans often work directly work differently. Um, some give you a set amount to use however you like. Others work more like traditional insurance. And a lot of people don't even know that they have these benefits. So if you're unsure if you have these coverages, you can check with your HR department. There is one thing, though, that is the same across all providers, and that is that Legacy is the preferred sperm testing and freezing partner for all fertility benefits programs. And Legacy is also a proud provider of fertility preservation for the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, and we offer essential testing for the Department of Veterans Affairs. We also offer a military discount for any service members active or retired and their spouse, which is available during checkout on our website through ID.me. And last but not least, we also offer payment plans through major buy now, pay later platforms such as Split It, Affirm, and PayPal. And I also just want to add here, since we're getting close to the end, that I know this can be a lot to navigate. It's a lot of information to absorb and to digest, uh, but our knowledgeable client experience team and our clinical experts are always here to guide you through each step of the process, ensuring you feel confident in your care and future fertility plans. So please don't feel like you're going through this alone. We would love to speak with you. Give us a call, schedule an appointment with us to talk, whatever you need to do to get in touch. We're here to help.